Warning. You've reached on the box with great comfort and are now in a biblical truth zone. Place all questions about theology, current events, and evangelism on the box where they'll be weighed against the truth of God's Word. Ready your hearts and minds. You're about to be inspired and equipped to fulfill the Great Commission. Programming to engage in five, four, three, two, one. Do we have an exciting program for you? I don't know. Do yes, we? we do. Yeah. Does Bruce Willis know that he looks like you? He, he's the lookalike. <laughs> and we have Mark's away today. He's working upstairs, and Mark, we have yeah, getting ready for a well-deserved vacation. Yeah, and we have Scotty in the other studio. Scotty's Let's... in the house. I am here <laughs> and ready. I've been looking some things up. Uh oh, yeah. well, good. We like that preparation for the show and all of that. Yeah, what are you trying to say? Nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these are the notes? <laughs> yes, sir. Left them on your desk okay. four minutes ago. Thank yes, you. sir. Thank you. Good stuff. So you what don't we need got? no stinking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a Bruce Willis line? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. Bruce, Bruce needs Christ. Yeah, don't we all? Yeah, yes, we do. Uh, came across a video that one of our viewers sent us. It's actually a couple of years old. There's a, a longer 33-minute version of this video, this testimony, mm -hmm. on the I'll Be Honest uh, YouTube uh, channel. Really good channel. Uh, great stories, great theology, great uh, uh, sermons on there. And this video that you're about to see, we're all about to see, is a three-minute clip from a longer testimony of a man who was a homosexual for 27 years mm. but was brought out of uh, that sin and that lifestyle uh, by the grace of God. So let's take a look. A lot of people say that they were made like this, that they were born this way, that they were born a homosexual. I, I actually thought that way f myself for a while. And what I came to realize is that how I got this way, I honestly, I don't really know how I got this way, but I know it's contrary to what God's Word said. God's Word is very clear. People try to, to suppress that truth. They try to change it. They try to, to, to make it fit their needs, but it's not what God's Word says. God's Word is very clear that it's wrong. So for those that say it's natural, it's normal, that's the same thing I felt at first after I, I realized what I'd done, I, I, I enjoyed this, the sexual pleasure of it. I enjoyed the sinful nature of it. Sin, sin is pleasurable for a season. But eventually that season ends and, and we're without hope. We're going to hell. We're going to pay for that sin. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit in the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So I would, I would say that any that think it's normal that to examine yourself and to make sure that what you're feeling is normal isn't really the sinful pleasure that you're enjoying, because that is normal, that is natural. It is natural for a fallen man to enjoy sin and to take late, great pleasure from it. I know it was in my life, I, I enjoyed my sin. I, obviously, I, that's what I didn't want to give up. I didn't want to give up that sin. But then when I drew near to God and He showed me the truth that I would never get, I would never be forgiven, I would never be able to fall at the cross until I gave up that sin, that sin that I loved, that sin I tried to hold on to. And so I did. I cast it at the cross and I jumped out in a leap of faith to, to Christ and, and He saved me from it. He redeemed me from it. He made me a real person. That's how I know what I'm telling you is true because He changed me. He made me a new person with the new desires. He took away all those sinful desires and made me a new creature. And He can do the same for you. He saved me from the power of sin and He can save you too. And I pray that you would cry out to Him that you could be made a new creature and be freed from your sinful lifestyle, from your sin that that holds you captive. Even though you may be a willing captive to it right now, someday you're going to be the, a captive of hell, paying the justice that's due, paying the ransom that's due. Because you'll find on that day that Christ didn't suffer your sins on the cross. You're suffering your sins now.
God bless him. You know, that is sin, righteousness, and judgment uncompromisingly preached in love and in gentleness. Yeah. I think it's very powerful. Yeah. You know, very the, powerful. A uh, couple of our uh, recent blog <laughs> posts have somewhat gone viral because we're, we've uh, challenged General Mills and Oreo cookies for, you know, waving the gay agenda, the homosexual agenda banner. <coughs> and some of the comments I've had to delete. I, I now have an idea of what you deal with on your blog on a much larger scale than, mm. than on our on the box blog. But they were so vile, so depraved. Mm. I mean, I felt like I had to, you know, pour salt water in my eyes just to cleanse them from that, what I had to, <coughs> to read. But the reason we're posting these things is to reach people like David. If we didn't because care, we, we care about, about them. Yeah. We want them to come to repentance and faith in Christ. We don't want them to perish in their sin. Yeah. But they so love their sin, uh, many of them anyways, that they can't see a message of real love because the love that they're experiencing in their life is so perverted and so contrary to the will of God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, season four, one of the great parts of season four, you want to introduce Sam before we do that? I just want to introduce, we've got a studio guest today, uh, our seats are one-eighth full in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's but Friday. You know, a lot of people traveling, getting out of town for the Stan, weekend. Stan, what's your last name? I didn't even get that. McInturf. Stan McInturf is here with us. He's got a day it's off. A he's Italian name. Yes. He's, <laughs> he's a senior videographer with CBN. He's a friend of mine, and uh, he's got a day off, and he's joining us to fill our studio audience. Speaking of videographers, mm -hmm. very exciting. You know how you uh, loathe my open-air preaching videos? Oh, you mean the ones where you film when the, you don't see the crowd? Yeah. Yes. I, I, I try to change things by putting the camera behind me mm -hmm. so that you could see people moving around. See, see, and, yeah. And, yeah. Well, it, they're still nothing compared to, you know, like, mm -hmm. way of the master. Well, oh. I've got a volunteer videographer. Oh, really? Someone who actually knows how to use a video camera and knows how to use Final Cut, born again follower of Christ, excited about evangelism going to join me on Saturday mornings. I don't know. Well, remembers to turn the camera on. That's all you need. I've forgotten oh, sometimes. I'm going to trust that he will remember more than me yes. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, all that to say, um, Mark, one of the great highlights of season four are Mark's uh, theological and apologetic segments during each episode. Oh, that's, they're wow, just... They're so good. They're, uh, when you watch Mark on green screen, you think, that is good, and then Dale gets hold of it, and it just bells and whistles, steroids, and just think, whoa, yeah, they're really brilliant. Well, in one of the episodes, I believe it was Milan, was it Milan? In the uh, Milan episode, uh, Mark addressed in part this, the issue of homosexuality, so we thought it would be a good short video to complement uh, David's testimony, so take a look. Just a part of our, who we are. That's it, we're very sinful, you're right. Since God made me as I am, and I sin, isn't sin God's fault? Some people claim that their desire to sin is just part of who they are, so it must be natural. They say, God made me this way or I was born this way. Well, that's partially correct. They were born that way. In the beginning, God created man with the ability to choose between right and wrong. Man chose to rebel against God, and as a result, mankind fell into depravity. Because of this, it's natural for us to be drawn into temptation and to sin. In the same way, pedophiles, adulterers, alcoholics, and drug addicts, they usually don't make a conscious decision to choose a self-destructive lifestyle. They simply give in to their sinful desires. But that doesn't make it okay. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Although a desire for sin is natural for unbelievers, God can change that. Jesus came to save his people from sin. God gives his children new desires and he helps them withstand temptation. The Bible says if any man's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Listen, don't blame God for your sin. Repent today while you still have time. Boy, that's the absolute miracle of conversion. I had no desire for God, no desire for righteousness, no desire for the Bible, no desire for church one day. Repented, trusted Christ. Next day, it was a burning passion. More than anything else, I wanted to please God. In fact, I, I had something in me that says, I delight to do your will, oh my God. And that new creature, that new heart, 
is the greatest evidence any of us could ever want yeah. because it's a transformation on the inside. First time I was born, it was radical. I didn't exist. Suddenly, God gave me life, and I did. It was a radical experience. I was here. Second time I was born again, it was just as radical. Brand new creature in Christ. Scotty, do you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, sure. The, um, Mark did such a good job, and the video expresses it so well, you know, the falling man and the sin. But it is just that. It's a choice, and uh, it's very clear in Scripture what, uh, what the determination is. It's wrong. It's against nature. Uh, thank God that David was able to see that and uh, hopefully help others to see uh, that it's a choice that's being made, not something God made in them that they have to do. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to see uh, the entirety of uh, David's testimony, we've posted the video on our blog at onthebox.us, onthebox.us. It ask. On, on the box dot That's because you got rid of the filter. Stan, well, in case I, you I, don't I, know, Tony had a mustache that looked like a kind of a front, uh, like a big front of an 18 wheeler the other day, and he shaved it off, and he came out from behind the forest. So that was the, that was the filter that fixed words that came out. But now it's all gone. It just. Have you ever worn ankle weights to strengthen your legs? No. Ever? <laughs> Why would I do that? Well, those of us who played football, we would do that to uh -huh. strengthen the lower half of our legs. We would wear these heavy ankle weights, walk around with so them. So your everything. top lip was weighed down. Is that what you're exactly. saying? Exactly. It's it, it, for me right now because I'm kind of st stammering and stuttering. For me right now, it's it's like my legs felt when I would take off those ankle so weights and walk around. Your top lip is liberated. I'm trying to learn how to control it. Now. <laughs> yeah. Moving on from my lip. Yeah. Um, first question of the day goes along with our first segment. This is from George. What would you say to your son or daughter if one day they told you they are a homosexual? I'd react the same way if they came to me and said, Mom, Dad, I think I was born a fornicator. I've just got this desire to commit fornication. And then adultery and theft and lying. I'd say that's sin. You're violating God's law and you have to answer to him on judgment day. And if you even think an unclean thought, God counts it as doing the deed. If you lust, you commit adultery. And so I'd put the fear of God in him. And I'd say it's your choice. You know, you're not a robot. You can do what you want. But what you're doing is an offense to God, whether it's lying, stealing, fornication, adultery. Read 1 Corinthians 6 through 9, 9 through 10 and talk about the reality of judgment day and the fact that judgment day may not be a long way off. It's a heartbeat from any of us. Yeah. And God could just lose patience with someone and say, okay, tonight you die. And Jesus spoke of that. He said to a um, guy who got all his goods stored up, tonight you fall, you fall and your soul is required of you. And God killed the man in Genesis 38 because he didn't like what he did sexually. Right. So I'd tell the kid that. And it also, I'd drop the egg. You know the egg dropping thing? You mentioned this before, but remind us all. Yeah, it's in, in the book, uh, How to Bring Your Children to Christ and Keep Them There. Take your... Take your son to the refrigerator, get an egg out and drop it on the floor. Uh, you say, I can't do that. You can do all things through Christ. You strengthen you. If you can't drop it, just place it in the air and let gravity do its thing. Watch the egg splat and say, what happened? There was a law involved. Gravity pulled it to the earth and that's the result. And if you jump out of a plane without a parachute, you're going to get the same result because the law of God, sorry, the law of gra or the gravity is, is un unmerciful. And it's the same with the law of God, but even on steroids. Yeah. If you sin against God, God's wrath is, is abiding on you, and you're in big trouble on Judgment Day. So I'd put the fear of God in him, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the scriptures say, through the fear of the Lord, men depart from sin. So that's yeah. what I'd do. Scotty? Yeah. Uh, it's really an authority issue, isn't it? Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> and with somebody so close, a son or a daughter coming and uh, divulging those things and all the emotions that spring up. But you know, it, it uh, really reminds me of just how depraved uh, going against God is because you influence others. And it's a confusing world out there, especially today, with uh, the uh, homosexual agenda to uh, make all of these things normal, to be accepted, and uh, being taught in schools and hearing it from teachers and assemblies and all these things. Well, who's right? Who's wrong? Uh, and kids are confused. And we need to come with the authority that says, here, this is right. 
and this is wrong. And how can I say that? Because we stand on the highest authority on earth, right. God's spoken word, God's written word. And I would take them to uh, Romans 1, which I think is the clearest definition of those things, but uh, that uh, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And likewise, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. I mean, you can't get much more explicit than that. And uh, so just as Ray said, they're, you know, dropping the egg. There are consequences, and this is uh, the authoritative word on what's right and what's wrong. Make the right choice and uh, do it for uh, for your own sake and do it for the sake of honoring uh, the one who gave you life and breath and all these wonderful gifts. Well put, Scotty. All right, our next question is from Ashley. Uh, I am working on a Bible study about forgiveness and I'm having trouble defining person-to-person -person forgiveness. I know that God's forgiveness means that we don't have to suffer the consequences of our sin in hell, but I'm not sure how this translates uh, with people. In the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18, I see that we are not to demand payment for a small debt because we have been forgiven a debt too enormous for uh, us to ever pay back. Uh, but what, what do we do with hurt feelings? I know my sin still offends God even though I'm forgiven, and there are some people I, I thought I forgave, but what they have done still hurts. Other Christians have told me that this is unforgiveness on my part. I thought a long time, as I'm not plotting or carrying out revenge, that I'm forgiving the person because I don't desire them any harm. Also in Matthew 18, 15 to 17, Jesus tells us how to treat a Christian who has sinned against us. Is forgiveness pointing out someone's fault, but not requiring retribution? Where is justice for more serious offenses? And how am I to treat a Christian if I am to treat them like a pagan? I'm concerned that this too would seem like unforgiveness. All right, so uh, the young lady's asking, uh, okay, I've forgiven these people, I believe I've forgiven these people, but I still carry around the hurt inside for what they've done to me. Mm -hmm. Has she forgiven them or not? I'd be very, very careful with that word hurt. Okay. <clears throat> because we tend to use it to justify resentment. And I, I heard something about 500 years ago that just stayed with me, and that is that there's a very downward and slippery path to rejection. It goes like this. Hurt, resentment, anger, hatred, bitterness, depression, suicide. Mm. And, that, and that can happen real quick. Someone sure can. hurt me, therefore I, re I get a sense of rejection. Then I move into self-pity and then anger. I'm justified in that being angry. And then hatred, bitterness. And then that brings with it depression. And then suicidal thoughts come. So if someone hurts me, I immediately try and forgive them from the heart. And then I pray for them. Pray for your enemies. Do good to those that despitefully use you. Uh, and so I usually send them a gift basket. I've sent Richard Dawkins, I think, three or four gift baskets. <coughs> and, uh, He's yeah, needed a lot of forgiveness. And sadly, the same right? with a young Christian gentleman that tried to bring down the ministry about three months ago. I sent him a b gift basket just so there's nothing in my spirit or in my heart that would hold on to a sense of being justified of being hurt by that guy. Because it says, let go of bitterness. It's in uh, Colossians. <laughs> um, uh, because we're not ignorant of the enemy's devices. Right. And that really is an enemy's device to divide and cause bitterness in the body of Christ. So, yeah, if you've got any hurts, confess them to God and then forgive from the heart and then pray for God's blessing on the person that so-called hurt you. So... Now, we know that when God forgives our sins, he removes them as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. We, though, in the flesh, we still remember some of the things that people have done to us. Are we to forget completely as well as forgive? Be good idea, too, because you don't want to keep remembering it. Chew it over. It's going to get... It's going to make you feel justified. And, and so what I do is, that if the memories come back, just immediately pray for God's blessing on that person. We're told to pray for our enemies, not just our brethren, but our enemies. Scotty, have you got some thoughts? I definitely do. <laughs> Carry the, on. You know, when I said I had looked some things up, well, this one really interested me because okay. it's kind of a thing that I go back and forth with, and I wanted to see, well, maybe I can pin something down here. And uh, I was really pleased in what I found. Um, the forgiveness, which is what we're talking about, and what's in this 
uh, Bible passage. Forgiveness is letting something go, and it really has to do more with the judicial side or the debt. It means to let the consequence, the punishment for the sin committed, that's what's meant by this forgiveness. Um, and uh, to, to let the consequence go, we're not punished for our sins, we're forgiven, and that yes, we committed these things, but we're let go from the consequence, and we're, uh, we come into an inheritance of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And when it says that God is not going to, uh, that our sins are cast away, is, is they're not going to be remembered, it's in the sense, I take it this way, and I'm going to say a little more that's going to help with this, it's in the sense that it's not going to be that it's not going to come up again mm, and yeah. you're, and the consequence remembered or visited you're not going to be judged for those things in, in, in that but let's talk about forget for a minute it doesn't say forget and there are actually um, several admonishments to remember things not necessarily sin and there's only uh, uh, two uses of the word forget in the New Testament. Both of them are in Hebrew. But uh, let me give you a couple here. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 4.9, it says, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest thou depart from thy heart um, all the days of thy life. But teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. Remember the things of the Lord. Remember the right. Look, we have memory. We have a brain. We're be, we've been given those things to uh, draw from and to keep things. That's what memory is. And we're not to forget the things of the Lord. By the same token, um, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, the things that he has made. God doesn't, isn't in the uh, business of forgetting. <laughs> and we're, we, thank, uh, we thank him for that, that he's going to remember his covenants and things. In the New Testament, Hebrews, uh, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work. And uh, both references are in there. So if, if uh, somebody had raped a daughter of mine and uh, and things had been reconciled I might be able to I'm commanded to forgive him um, but should I forget the act if he wants to date uh, my other daughter um, you know some of that doesn't make sense if you try to apply forget uh, to all these things, oh, you're never to remember those things. I learn and I uh, continue <clears throat> to learn. But that doesn't mean I hold on to the consequences of those things. I have to let those things go. I have to forgive. I have to love that person. I have to pray for them. But, and, you know, Scotty, it sounds like you're making a distinction between uh, trust and bitterness. You know, if, yeah, if, if someone stole my car and wrecked it, Mm -hmm. And came to me the next day and said, uh, hey, I'm, I'm really, really sorry I messed up your car. Oh, I'm commanded to forgive that person. Yeah. But when they ask me for the keys, <laughs> I do that. And I don't give them my keys because I don't trust them. Forgiveness is given, but trust is earned. Yeah. That's a good point. Great perspective, Scotty. Yeah. All right. Uh, we got, uh, you know what? I know you want to do a failed sunrise today. We're almost done. We're on day 29 of 30. Yeah. So why don't we do that, and if there's time remaining, we'll try to answer one more question. Okay, let's go. All right. Day 29 with David and Marcus. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, man, you should see the sunrise I got today, man. It is wonderful, man. Oh, I bet he can't top what I got. Oh, what you got? Oh, is that the beach, man? Is that the beach? Yes, sir. That's the beach. It's beautiful, man. How did, how did you get a beach in northern Georgia? I drove. Oh. Good morning, Daddy. Hey, hey, was that, well, hold on, was that a kid? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I brought Alex. Tell me where you are, man. Skype me in. I'm sorry, what'd you say? The, the waves are a little loud. I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, I said, I said, Skype me in. Let me see a picture. 
skip you in? What you talking about? I said, show me a picture of where you are at. Oh, I'll show you where I'm at. I'm at the beach, but I hardly can get a signal out here on the cell phone. I mean, look, you're breaking up. Touch hunt. So you can't. Hey, 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 David. 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 You don't think you know, do you? All right. That was easy. Yes. Oh, one more day and one more day, two more, one more. We're almost back online. There we go. I talked too soon. Okay, what do we wait, got? Wait, well, I feel like I'm wearing one of those like medieval. That's what I've actually halos. noticed. I've noticed. You look like a what do they call Byzan well, Byzantine? Byzantine. You're a Byzantine. I'm the Byzantinian bald man. <laughs> Yeah, the flat plate. So we don't have time for another thing. We don't. Scotty, do you gonna, think, what are you doing tomorrow, Scotty? Yeah, I was wondering if you were going to mention that, right? We've got we're going to have seconds. a good time tomorrow. And, and all of those who are in Southern California, you need to come out to Huntington Beach. <laughs> no! <laughs> because uh, yeah, so, Ray is going to try something new. Oh, what are you going to do? I'm not, what are you going to do? I'm not telling anyone because it's either going to work and be brilliant or it's just going to flop and I'm be gonna dumb. I'm going to film it, though. Yeah, Scotty's going to film it. So pray for us. National Geographic. Uh, channel and visiting here Monday morning. Please pray Sorry, for us. We're well. filming for a whole day with them. Something very interesting. So, value your prayers. Hope you've enjoyed today's show and I hope you have a wonderful and blessed weekend. For questions about On the Box with Ray Comfort or to submit questions for future shows, please email on the box at livingwaters.com. That's on the box at livingwaters.com. On the Box with Ray Comfort is an outreach of Living Waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll-free 1-800-437-1893. Now go and preach the gospel.